Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm George Arkadakis. I work for a company called Willis Towers Watson. Uh, before I begin with a show of hands, I'd like to ask you if you're familiar with the, with the terms Fourth Industrial Revolution. Is everyone familiar with those terms? Some are. Some. How many of you are worried that you will be replaced by a robot or software? Can I have a show of hands, please? Pretty confident crowd. Okay. How many of you are absolutely certain that you will not be replaced by a, a robot or a software? Okay, so I think most of you in this room are not exactly certain, right? So I hope I'll be, out, I'll be able to answer this uncertainty. So let me begin uh, by setting the scene a little bit. Um, this guy here is Lisa Dahl. Uh, used to be, I, I guess he still is, the human champion of Go, the game Go. Uh, in March 2016, he was beaten by AlphaGo, an algorithm that was developed by, by Google. IBM Watson, which is a supplier of, uh, which is a supplier of AI um, uh, software as a platform, is claiming that its software can diagnose lung cancer with a success rate of 90% as opposed to 50% of human doctors. And um, a few months ago, uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland shed uh, around 550 jobs, replacing those humans with robo-advisors. So AI is very much in the news. Meanwhile, uh, robots are evolving. They're not stuck in the assembly line. They now have legs. They can walk. They can roll. They can crawl. They can fly. They can swim. There's a host of technologies that is merging around the robot, new sensors, new actuators, and of course software, that is transforming them from what we can sort of compare it to like a mainframe to what is now a PC that you can very easily program. Um, you can program your household uh, robots using your smartphone by tapping to supercomputing power in the cloud. So there's a big change around robots. And it's robots and artificial intelligence who are the driving technologies of the so-called fourth industrial revolution, or so we're told. So the first question I'd like to ask and hopefully answer is this hype. Shall we take this seriously? Or is it just the media sort of spinning up the story so perhaps guys like me can get invited into um, events like that? I mean, after all, artificial intelligence has been with us for 60 years and has gone through two, at least two long winters of AI. I have lived through one of those winters. When I was doing my PhD in AI, it was the late 80s, and it was like one of the winters of AI. So what's changed? What makes AI and robots so important for us to understand that they are triggering a new industrial revolution. And I think to answer a question like that, let's go back to the first industrial revolution a bit and, and have a think about what, what exactly happened there. On your left-hand side, you see the uh, Thomas uh, Newcomen um, steam engine, a precursor of the Watts. Steam engine, as you know, steam power and steam engines were the driver, the triggering technology of the first industrial revolution. These machines basically replaced uh, manual labor, human Man manual labor. However, steam engines and steam power was not invented in the mid-18th century. It was in fact invented back in Egypt, in Alexandria, uh, the first century. Uh, on the right-hand side, you can see the first steam engine that humans discovered was discovered by and designed and, uh, by a Greek engineer called Hero. So one of the interesting questions in world history is why didn't the first industrial revolution occur in uh, Roman Alexandria? Why do you have to wait for 1700 years uh, for the steam engine, the steam power, to be reinvented in England? And I think this is a good question because it may answer our, our, our original question as well. Is this the time for a new industrial revolution or not? So I'd like to uh, suggest to you that two conditions must be met for a, a technology that replaces human labor to trigger an industrial revolution. And I think the first condition that has to be met is an, it's an economic condition. The human labor, the cost of human labor, must be greater than the cost of, of purchasing and running this alternative technology. So if you look back in history, you'll find out that the cost of labor in uh, Roman Alexandria was pretty low compared to the cost of labor in, uh, in 18th century England. So there was lots, of, and also the cost of uh, buying those uh, steam engines and replacing the humans w made economic sense. So this condition was met in the 18th century, but was not met on the first century. But there's another condition that needs to take place as well. 
And that is that the alternative technology, the technology that replaces the humans, must be scalable. It must, you must be able to make uh, multiple copies of it, and you must be able to distribute this technology far and wide. Again, this was not true in first century Egypt. It was very hard to make uh, multiple copies of Hira's uh, steam engine and distribute them and so on. Things were completely different in, in 18th century England. Um, um, we could uh, organize work a lot better. Manufacturing processes had evolved. Learned societies, universities meant that people uh, exchanged ideas and developed and evolved ideas much faster. So those two conditions were met indeed for a technology like the steam engine to cause the first industrial revolution. So fast forward into the future. Let's see what happens now. Are these two uh, conditions that I suggest um, present or not. So let's start with labor. You probably agree that the past few decades have seen um, an enormous, a, a great period, if you like, in, 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 the, in the economy of the world. Uh, GDP rising, inflation uh, being kept low, mostly because of cheap labor in China. So what you had in China, you had a, a, a phenomenon of millions of workers leaving uh, rural areas and um, coming into uh, urban centers and working for the, manufacturer sec for the manufacturing sector. And because the supply of labor was enormous, that meant if inflation was kept low. It's a unique phenomenon in, in economic history. But this has changed a lot. Uh, the, the unit cost of, uh, Chinese, um, of, the Chinese, of the average sort of assembly line uh, Chinese worker has shot up. It used to be below $1 per hour back in uh, 2000. It is now approaching $5 per hour, which explains why many Chinese companies are relocating uh, to Vietnam or indeed are embarking on a massive automation of the labor force. Just to give you an example, uh, a sense of, um, of the size of the market right now, uh, the robotics market worldwide is around $135 billion and is rising at, a, at an annual rate of around 17%. 16% of this market is uh, of this uh, of this investment is spent in Asia, with China having a greater, ever greater uh, percentage of that of that 69%. So we're talking about the cheap, uh, the, the end of of cheap labor. But how about let's say robots? The cost of robots is, is decreasing enormously. Uh, what you see uh, up, up on the slide is uh, a robot called Baxter. It's uh, manufactured by Rethink Robotics. It sells for around $25,000, which is a price that even small manufacturers can afford. And the cost of running uh, uh, a robot like that is below a dollar an hour. So the economic ar argument is very clear. In fact, um, Research shows that on average, global-wise, if you replace humans with, uh, by robots, you get at least 16% uh, savings on, on your costs. If you are an advanced nation, uh, industrialized nation, this uh, savings can go up to maybe 35 to 40%. So it, it's a no-brainer for companies to automate their workforce. But how about scalability? The difference between uh, AI when I was doing my PhD in the 80s and AI now is, of course, the cloud and the sc scalability that AI um, can enjoy uh, as a platform. So I, I mentioned before IBM, IBM Watson. Uh, if you're a developer, the only thing you, you need to do is go to IBM Watson, uh, get their API, plug the, uh, their API on your application and add to this artificial intelligence uh, element to your application. It's, it can scale massively because of the cloud. Very soon, uh, more advanced technologies like the one that beat uh, Lisa Doll, like uh, machine learning, will also be scalable. Um, indeed, that you might see as the Internet of Things takes place and uh, you know, massive data is, uh, is made available. There will be companies that will be uh, selling uh, data lakes. So you can take your machine learning algorithms and train them. So you will see scalability in those advanced technologies as well. So, if robots will replace our brawn and AI replaces our brain, the big question is, uh, what will there be left for us to do? Okay? Uh, is this the end of work? And this is a debate, an ongoing debate. Um, I think it was kick-started more or less with this uh, paper from uh, two economists at Oxford University. They looked into US labor data. Uh, they ran some calculations, and they came out with this number, that 47% of US jobs will be obsolete in the next 10 years because of um, automation, because of uh, 
AI and robots, which is a very daunting number, right? What do, uh, you know, I mean, the repercussions of such, a, such an impact are sort of unfathomable, I would say. Nevertheless, since then, a number of other organizations um, have looked into the data in a more nuanced approach. I'd like to share with you some data from uh, a McKinsey report that looked at jobs not as something monolithic, but it, it broke them down into activities, which makes a lot more sense. And looked into, uh, into jobs in this way and found out that 45% of job activities can be automated with existing technology, with existing technology. Like, for instance, when you go and check in, right? You don't, have, you don't check into a human anymore. But what if you added AI on existing technology? Then what you get is a big rise. It goes up to 58% of job activities can be automated. OK, so let me make that a little bit more definite, what that means. That means that 60% of jobs, that means 60% of the jobs perhaps represented in this room, 30% of those activities will be automated. OK, 30% of, of those job activities will be automated. Now. What does that really mean, okay? And why is this significant, if you like, for you and I? It means, in real uh, dollars, that per, per year, American companies, let's say, they will save something like a trillion dollars in wage savings, which is great for companies. But the challenge here is, and usually it's called the, the, uh, the paradox of automation, is that this money that's saved from, from, from the companies is subtracted from the income of the workers. So the first challenge that we will be faced with uh, in the world of uh, job automation will be exactly this paradox. When you, when you make workers poorer, how will they be able to have enough money to buy the products and services that those automated uh, machines will make? And of course, there are ideas how to resolve this paradox. I just want to present to you and hopefully we'll have a discussion in Q&A. We at Willis Stars Watson, we had an, a look at entry-level jobs. And uh, we did some analysis and we found that many of those entry-level jobs, the jobs that is that young graduates get once they get out of university in order to climb the, the career ladder, can be, can be automated. Like, for instance, this, I'll give you an example. Like a marketing analyst, it costs uh, uh, to a U.S. company around $123, let's say, $1,000. Uh, salaries, benefits, pensions, onboarding, development, recruiting, and so forth. Compared to, uh, let's say, uh, a marketing automation system with AI that we estimate will maybe cost like an, on an annual sort of operating cost of around $20,000. So again, a no-brainer. Okay, if you're a CFO, you know, the decision is, it's not even a decision. But what will that mean for young graduates? How will they be able to climb into the, into the employment ladder? See, people say that AI will automate the boring stuff thereby making the rest of us, uh, making us more creative, which is probably true. But as you know, uh, when you come out of university, when you enter the job market, you really need to do the, the boring stuff. Because if you don't do the boring stuff, you will never be able to be, to be creative. I mean, creativity means that you understand the boring stuff. So that is the second challenge. What would that mean, you know, in, uh, about w I, on, on how we educate young people, for example, or how we train young workers and so forth? Now, it's, all, it's not all doom and gloom. I'm just sort of mentioned two of the challenges of automation. But then again, uh, maybe automation has come sooner or later, sooner than later. Uh, and that has to do with human productivity. I mean, if you look again at uh, the financial data, let's say, in, in the UK, uh, the productivity growth in the UK since 2009 is, is around 0.1%. Uh, okay, that's very low. And if you look at the uh, number of people being employed, it's very, very high. So that is a bit of a conundrum. I mean, lots of people are being employed, almost the highest percentage of employment between 16 and 64 ever since records began, and yet productivity is very low. That means that if you want to sustain society through you know, the pension system, the healthcare system, and so forth, there's only one possibility. You have to extend working lives. So therefore, you know, some of us will perhaps, I don't know, get a pension when we're in, in, in the late 70s. If that uh, trend persists. And maybe this is what uh, automation will do for us. It will help us become more productive and therefore have a more sensible working life. But, but we can discuss that as well, if you like, in Q&A. So, okay, so let's go back into this sort of major disruption that AI and, and robots will cause. Now, what, how, how the world will be like, let's say, 10 years from now, with all this automation? Can we, um, 
Can we imagine what it would be like? I would argue that we can because the job market is already changing because of uh, digital platforms. Like, for instance, Odesk or Freelance or, or Top Coder. So, you know, in my own company, we see uh, many of our, our, our clients, which are Fortune 500 companies, moving towards a model where they increasingly um, do their, uh, the, uh, do many of the core business processes using um, online digital uh, talent platforms. That is, uh, finding free agents and free contractors and bringing them uh, through, the, through, through those uh, talent platforms to do um, what used to be done by full-time employees. So there is definitely a trend in companies, especially in big companies, to, to shrink the number of full-time employees in favor of those uh, digital talent platforms. And there are advantages and disadvantages for both sides here, for the companies and the workers, obviously. But we think that this trend will persist and, in fact, will become even more so when AI will start automating a lot of job activities. So maybe the gig economy is a harbinger, if you like, of what uh, uh, the future of the labor market might, might be. OK. So let me summarize um, some of the key points of the impact of AI uh, in the workplace. And I understand that you guys are mostly IT professionals. Uh, and I hope that uh, by giving you, uh, you know, the, the perspective from the workplace, you can then think back to what AT will have to do in this new world where for instance, business processes are um, a lot more dispersed than they are today, when things are happening a lot more outside the organization that, rather than inside the organization. So let me summarize some of those, those points that I just mentioned. First of all, it's very likely that full-time employment will, will shrink even more as we become more and more contractors and free agents, possibly empowered through AI, collaborating with AI systems. Uh, learning through AI systems continuously in order to um, uh, continuously uh, be the creative uh, part of this new symbiosis, if you like, between AI systems and humans. This collaborative economy or the gig economy, as it expands, it will put the burden on all of us when it comes to pensions, uh, when it comes to uh, insurance, when it comes to banking, meaning that uh, the middle layer of the financial system will probably erode. It will be mo a more direct uh, relationship between uh, you know, the, uh, the, the funding and, uh, and the retail. And that might mean that blockchain uh, technologies like uh, Bitcoin will become even more pr uh, prevalent. Corporations will evolve into value people and AI networks. By that I mean, again, that as Organizations lose a lot of their core workforce as they uh, become uh, more agile, as they scale agile within, within their, um, their business processes, as they move towards models like a shared services model that are sort of uh, uh, resourced from the, those digital talent uh, platforms, uh, they will change. They, you can imagine them as, uh, let's say, an agile ecosystem of very, very uh, small organizations that group together in order to produce value and then regroup to uh, produce value in another way and so forth. And what that will mean that you need uh, a completely different kind of uh, information systems in order to support that. We, probably, we will probably see the government playing an increasingly uh, important role in society, uh, covering uh, those bumps, those valleys in uh, our, our, our employment life, uh, possibly through the uh, through universal income. There are several countries already that are experimenting with universal income, like uh, Finland, uh, Canada in Ontario, Holland here in Europe. Um, and finally, information becomes a utility. Let me... Let me explain to what I mean by that. I think that in you know, a few years' time, the children of the future will look back into this, into our present time here now in the early 20th century and be bewildered to see people like us you know, interacting with information through hardware. They'll be surprised that we need to uh, interact through hardware, uh, that the hardware that actually has processing power in order to be able to interact with information. So AI is already coming and um, becoming an extra layer on top of IT, on top of existing IT systems, a layer that allows for a different kind of communication and relation between humans and, um, and machines and information. So if you imagine the cloud being the first push towards information becoming a utility, if you like, or have the characteristics of a utility, 
AI will push this to its logical conclusion. So imagine a time where you can build whatever you like and just plug it into an information grid and the right information flows into your system and brings it alive. There's a picture that I want to share with you, uh, which is, you know, for the geeks amongst you, this is, you know, the Iron Man building something and not really worrying about where this information comes from in order to, uh, to, to make these things possible. So we will see that uh, as a possible scenario for the future, information becoming as a utility. Okay, so let me finish uh, by uh, sharing with you some thinking, some uh, of our latest thinking uh, that we, uh, that we uh, have at Willie Stars Watson, how we um, advise, if you like, our clients to prepare for this fourth industrial revolution when it comes to the human talent, when it comes to managing, acquiring, managing, developing human resources. So we think that companies will have to do three things, really. They have to rethink three areas of their talent uh, management very carefully. One is how they assign jobs. This whole business that I mentioned before uh, around jobs and activities and the difference between them, understanding which of those activities will, have to be, will be automated or can be automated and what that means in terms of um, uh, re rethinking the whole business of, of job structures. It will affect their organization and I've alluded to uh, how companies and organizations will evolve into more sort of agile organizations, slimmer, leaner organizations with many connections and many, co and many collaboration paths uh, coming in and out, uh, more flexible. And finally, of course, rewards, how companies think of rewards. So now it's a very sort of you know, traditional, uh, monolithic um, way of um, thinking of rewards is your, you know, your salary, your benefits, and so forth. What will happen when most of your workforce will be um, uh, free agents? What, uh, what will that mean? Because there, you need to balance two things. You need to enjoy the, fin the uh, financial benefit of not having full-time employees, but at the same time, you want to uh, uh, keep talented people attached to, the, to your organization. They seem to be very conflicting. After all, that's why you have full-time employees, in order to solve this dilemma. But maybe there are other ways to solve this dilemma as we move towards a more sort of uh, agile, a more flexible, and uh, a more insecure uh, labor market in the future. So, uh, let me finish by just uh, concluding, if you like, and I'll, I'll put it across to you for discussion, that this is... This is not an upgrade. This is definitely not an upgrade. This is, uh, this is definitely a revolution uh, with huge impact across everything that we, we take for granted today, especially the way we develop ourselves as, as professionals, the way we plan a financial future uh, as, uh, as professionals and as human beings. So be prepared and be prepared to be amazed. Thank you very much. There's a, there's a chap there with two mics, and we've got about seven minutes, eight minutes, so please, comments and questions that I may be able to answer. Hi there. Ed. Hi. I thought that was very interesting. I guess we might need to buy a book to find the full answer to this question, but in brief, would you say you're an optimist or a pessimist about the ultimate end of AI? Just to sort of put it into my layman's terms, as IT people, we sort of know that the quality of your output is only as good as the quality of your input, and we can't possibly predict what machines will do with the sort of seeds that we give them, you know, where, where it will take that, and, if, you know, do you think we should try and keep the reins on to some extent, or if, you know, if the reins are off, do you think that could go in potentially <laughs> catastrophic directions, <laughs> or sort of more utopian directions. Thank, th thank you for that, for that question. I think I'm optimistic for countries that have uh, strong political institutions where you can have um, a good political debate and uh, be able to take the right decisions. I'm, I'm very optimistic for those countries. I'm very optimistic for the countries that don't have it. Okay, if I can answer it that way. Because mainly it would be a political choice what we do with AI. Okay. Do you think there's a bit of a, a moral element to it in terms of those who aren't value people, as you've mentioned it, 
would be kind of consigned to the scrap heap for, for life, really, because they won't be able to contribute uh, as a detail. Okay, thank you. Um, there was a book that was published a few years ago called Average is Over by an American economist called Tyler Cowen. And he looked at the data and more or less came to this conclusion that the future belongs to the ultra smart, in fact. I don't believe that, personally. And again, going back to my previous answer, this is a technology that can afford us, let's say, a new level of, of civilization unimagined so far. We can use it to... Um, uh, to get new insights through data, uh, discover new things, solve health problems. I mean, the, the, uh, the example I gave with, uh, with the IBM Watson before, imagine, you know, the problem we have now with the, health, with the healthcare system is very high cost. This cost can be reduced dramatically if you replaced uh, many of the, of the things that are happening now with, uh, with automation. So there's a lot of advantage there. And again, I think it's a political choice that we will be called upon to make of how we distribute, if you like, this new bounty more equitably uh, 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 on, the, on the people. Sir. Can you imagine a world where people um, are disenfranchised because there's a lot of big corporations on a lot of money and they're called upon to provide all this government funding for people who don't have jobs? Uh, how can you see that as being equitable? Well, exactly. Uh, this will, is not equitable. So um, the, the current thinking you know, amongst, let's say, futurists looking into the impact of AI sort of explores uh, various scenarios. Okay? So one possible scenario is very much what you describe, whereby uh, you know AI belongs to big corporations. You know AI does everything. Um, you know those guys become very rich, and so forth. Uh, econ economy is not a zero-sum game, so it's a positive-sum game. Okay, and you need to to somehow um, uh, perhaps regulate this game. So there is, of course, inequality, but then. Uh, what uh, the economists call the spread and the bounty. So there is bounty, and some people have more of that, but the spread between the people that do have most of it and the rest of us is not as big. Again, this is a political choice. It will not happen automatically. I mean, if you let it be, this spread will just grow and grow. And that's, that's, we see that happening already today. Ah, uh, there's one gentleman down there. A lot of what you talked about focused on the functional aspects of, uh, of AI. Do you see a day when there's independent thinking and, the, and artificial intelligence is used to run organizations, maybe governments? You mean AI being able to do strategic thinking and decision making? I believe it's, it's theoretically possible, yes. I, I, I definitely do. And uh, just to give you an example why I think so, uh, nobody in the AI, well, very few people in the AI community expected AlphaGo to beat uh, Lisa Dole in this game so soon, right? Now, the big problem with AI, in order to be, for AI to, to deliver on what you just said, is that AI must acquire what is called general intelligence. Okay, and this is the big problem here in AI. It's not creativity. Uh, AlphaGo is creative. You know, it beat that guy creatively, right? So creativity is not an issue when it comes to you know, taking decisions to the level that you've described. It's general intelligence that is, is the big problem. And um, because of the massive investment in AI right now, there's a lot of smart people that are thinking on this problem as we speak. So I think they will crack it, ultimately. It's theoretically possible, let's say, yeah? Any more questions? Okay. So. Who do you think will um, have overall control? Would it be the companies with the AI or would it be the governments? Again, um, it, it is a political choice. It's certainly a political choice. It will call upon us as societies to take a decision. Uh, what will be the right balance between uh, government intervention and, uh, and free economics? in a world that those who have 
this technology, those who own this technology, can do so much more than ever imagined before. So we're talking about a massively powerful technology that can change everything. So it's a big sort of, if you like, too many things are at risk right now to just le let it be, to just leave it as it is and, and you know, make it take its course. So I think this will be one of the hardest political choices that we'll be called upon to make in the next few years. And that is also very important that you know, people are informed about artificial intelligence and robotics and this political debate about it and, and so on. Do we have time for one more question? Gentleman at the back. Um, renowned experts are talking about the singularity happening in 30 or 40 years. Do you subscribe to that? Uh, no, I don't. I don't subscribe to that. And um, you know, the, the quick answer to not su subscribing to that is that this singularity argument has uh, a number of assumptions around it. And I don't agree to any of those assumptions. Uh, just, I'm just going to point out one. Uh, one of the major assumptions in the singularity point is that somehow a AI, some kind of like super AI, becomes super intelligent and does something to, re to bring destruction upon everybody else. I think that what we will be seeing, it will, it will be a society of AIs. It will be a much more complex system of artificial intelligence, perhaps one checking the other. So it will be a, a more sort of cybernetic type of system rather than having like a, 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 an autocratic system uh, when it comes to AI. Thank you. So thank you very much. Thank you all of you and thank you for your attention and your interest. Thank you. <laughs>